Happy Halloween! I'm really excited for this Halloween. What are you going to be dressing up as this year? Are you going to be dressing up? Probably not. <laughs> it's too much effort. <laughs> that's fair. I mean, that's that's me, like, for every holiday. I'm just like, you know what? I'll give candy to some people on Halloween. I'll I'll give a, a present to my mom on Christmas. We'll eat, like, a turkey on Thanksgiving. We put in, like, just the bare necessities when mm -hmm. it comes to national holidays, you know? For that. Bare necessities. I was waiting okay. for it. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually why I said it. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I mean, um, all that matters to me is the fact that I'm going to have Rally dress up, so. What's he dressing up as? So. The pug boy? <laughs> I got him this new costume because he's been bat dog for like, I don't know, like three years in a row. But, uh. No, 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 bat dog! But now he's got a new one on the way, so we'll see how that goes. Is it a secret? It's a surprise. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I haven't dressed up for Halloween since I think, like, I was 10, I want to say. I haven't trick-or-treated since I was, like, 9 or 10. And I remember mm -hmm. I was in this, like, penguin onesie. <laughs> it was pretty cute and really comfortable. That is adorable. Um, I, one of my fondest memories, though, okay, this isn't a fond memory, because I hated this school, but, like, I was in this one school for, like, only fourth grade, right? Mm -hmm. And um, at that school, uh, we, for Halloween, did Thriller in the parking lot, mm -hmm. so every single kid in the fourth grade, like, they played Thriller on a boombox, and we all came in our costumes and did Thriller and did the walk and stuff like that, and oh, I no. did it in my penguin onesie, and it was the most oh. iconic thing ever. <laughs> I wish I could have seen that. <laughs> I kind of wish you did too. It's pretty cute. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. is an infinitely more uh, cute costume than what I have planned for this year. I think I'm actually going to dress up for the first time in a very long time because... Uh, and I know what I, it is. You know what it is. I, I, I won't. I'll, I'll spoil the surprise. Why not? Because I managed to get my hands on a Beetlejuice costume... Uh, and uh, I got the hairspray, and uh, I got the hair for it, honestly. I got the poofy hair. <laughs> um, so, honestly, I'm set, man. I'm just going to hope that, like, COVID doesn't come into the party, and I'm just going to... And, and you know what? If it does, then I can celebrate everyone's death. So, <laughs> oh, God. All's, all's good. <laughs> A little too in character. A little too much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> speaking of death... We wanted to talk, uh, we wanted to theme this episode of Life of Screens on horror media, um, and specifically, like, seeking discomfort as a whole. I wanted to start off by talking about the fact that I freaking don't like horror movies and, <laughs> or horror games. I imagine that you're the same. Yeah, for the most part, especially horror movies, I just, I'm not a fan of. I don't mm. enjoy it. I don't seek out watching horror <laughs> films at all. <laughs> And rest assured, this podcast is not going to be an hour-long video of us talking about all the reasons we don't like horror, all the times we've been traumatized from horror, and it's just bad, bad, bad. No, 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 no. We're, we're not, it's not going to be that boring. But <laughs> I, I will say, I will say that freaking the one time when I was freaking forced to play Five Nights at Freddy's 4, man, ugh, um... <laughs> I, I mean, here's the thing with horror. I, I think we should, like, lay some groundwork re real quick about, like, how much horror we can tolerate. Mm -hmm. um, I obviously don't like graphic violence. I don't like seeing people's, like, actual body parts being torn off or, like, really, like, you know, intricate, violent things and stuff like that. And usually movies do that, like, right off camera. That's fine. Like, mm -hmm. I'm even surprised that in Avengers Endgame they had a beheading in the first, like, 20 minutes of the movie. That really surprised me, but um, mm. considering how big of a movie it is. But, like, I mean, it, it was, like, kind of in shadow, silhouetted, whatnot. Um, regardless, like, that's fine with me. And, like, Mortal Kombat does that some kind of stuff like that. It's not graphic enough that it bothers me. That's okay. But, like, an atmospheric horror, I think, is lovely. I really love atmospheric horror. Um... It's part of the reason why, even though we say we don't like horror movies, I, I do like myself a good, like, 80s horror movie, uh, mm -hmm. where jump scares weren't as much of a big thing. However, it, uh, 
sometime around uh, 2014, 13, 15, around then, uh, a couple of indie games came on the scene that made their mark in the public consciousness with their jump scares. And FNAF, Five Nights at Freddy's, is the biggest example I can think of. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of people really love Five Nights at Freddy's because of the overarching story that the game never tells you. you oh, <laughs> freaking hell. Um, but I I know that I, I never like could enjoy it properly or settle into it properly because I am a... Um, a scaredy, fraidy cat who doesn't like jump scares. And yet, uh, one time I went over to my friend Kyle's house when uh, Five Nights at Freddy's 4 came out and he sat me in his chair and made me play Five Nights at Freddy's. I'm like, I want to do it. And, and like, you know what? He pushed me enough that I was like, fine, man, fine. Mm. I And like, you could literally hear in my voice how scared I was because I oh, was no. like peeking around the corner and I was like, I hope something's not there. Something is there. And I'm like, oh, my friend. <laughs> like, I was just like, my reactions were pretty dang, like, they're pretty, they're they're pretty funny. I, I can see how it would have been funny outside of my body, you know, <laughs> looking at me. But, like, but as I yourself. Got, I, kill me now. Um, <laughs> I remember I got scared. I got killed by Chica and, um. I remember the scream. I freaked out in my chair. I was like, oh, oh. And, and Kyle was just kind of like chuckling. Like he was unfazed. And like, it's so crazy to me that there exists people who um, play like, what what is it? Like Ultimate Custom Night or whatever, where there's like, turn on 50 animatronics at the same time that are all trying to kill you. And it's just like a oh, challenge God. at that point. It's just all about the gameplay. And if you get k- killed by a jump scare, it's like, all right, cool. Just roll to try again. It's so crazy to me how nullified you can get, you know? Yeah, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> I do want to get to that, but later on. Uh, there's another FNAF story that I have, actually. We were taking a Spanish test. Um, I finished my <laughs> Spanish test kind of... Um, I was, like, one of the first few people to finish it, but the first person who finished it was already on their phone. They were playing FNAF 2 on their phone. Uh, this was freshman year of high school, so this was... yeah. Um, he was playing it on his phone, and then when I finished, I sat back down in my desk, and this dude goes, stands up from his desk, walks over to me, puts his phone on my desk, and then leaves, and he's like, make sure I don't die. I'm like, wait, what? What do you mean? So I picked up his (laughs) phone, and I saw it was FNAF. I'm like, oh, just shoot me now. Why? (laughs) It's a very quiet testing room, you know? Everyone's trying to focus on their quiz. I don't want to just, out of nowhere, just yelp like a girl (laughs) because like bonnie kills me or whatever like come on (laughs) i didn't even know you could play it on your phone (laughs) yeah i think they're all on phone um wow which i mean good for kids who like that i guess (laughs) which oh my god you remember slender man yeah (laughs) that was a thing too that was also on phone i remember playing that and i was like no this is uh, i'm scared i'm scared (laughs) i'm a little girl sometimes it's all good it's all good (laughs) it happens it does um but yeah i i um do do you have any particular uh, memorable stories about being scared do you want to like lay the groundwork for how uh tolerant you are of uh scares and whatnot (laughs) I guess like in in general I I'm not great with like jump scares and stuff um and for me um even though I can appreciate atmospheric horror in like video games and stuff uh in movies and in TV shows uh, it's not really my thing um cuz I I just it, it gets too real almost, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, it, it definitely invokes a sense of anxiety. And I'm like, I already experience enough of this in my daily life, you know? <laughs> I don't need to, like, add on to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> real life is a horror movie. Yeah, 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 <laughs> oh, God. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> but, like, yeah, so for me, um, I, I, uh, I... I realized a few i want to say like one or two years ago actually that i have a problem (laughs) um i realized that it's actually really hard for me to immerse myself in 
like a game or a movie. And, and that's not to say like immerse myself as in like um get involved oh, in the I, story. But like like yeah, I I can very much get involved with the story. I'll find the story yeah. super engaging. What I mean is that I have never cried at fiction before. And I think that's because I I have a lot of trouble emotionally connecting myself to the, you know, the characters and the story like enough so that it becomes like really personal for me. Mm. Um, because I, I feel like by that point when like, I'm always just focusing on like, oh, this person did this like writing thing here. And like, oh, the reason that this character was seen like here and here so that they could build up to this really sad moment here and stuff like that. And by that point, I'm just like, you know, that's what I'm thinking about. (laughs) I'm just thinking about it from the writer's perspective and that's no fun. Um, (laughs) in that sense, we're, we're kind of opposites because I definitely get invested in stuff and I, have cried at many uh many uh media <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> even stuff on my channel like when i played your turn to die there's like videos of me like playing that and just like crying while i'm trying <laughs> to read the lines <laughs> yeah i wish i could do that that's the thing like i wish that when scares happened and stuff i was scared like not I wish I was, like, scared for the character, you know? I wish I wasn't scared just for, like, like, because it's, like, taking me out of the experience and stuff like that. Because here's the thing. You will never catch me writing a jump scare into a story, and here's why. Mm-hmm. When someone who doesn't like scares is exposed to a jump scare, and they know that the piece of media is willing to do that, they, they know it's fair game now, even if it's infrequent. Mm. Like, in the game she mentioned, Your Turn to Die. For those who don't know, Your Turn to Die is a uh, indie death game visual novel game. Um, it doesn't have that many jump scares, but when it does, it does have very few and they're very spread apart and they don't really have a place in the story and they're infrequent. But the second one happened, I'm like, okay, now I got to stay on my toes. And it (laughs) didn't let me feel like, like I could attach myself to everything that went on in the game because that now I'm like defending my own, like, oh, I don't want to be scared because I don't watch media to be scared. I don't like it. And whenever there was a jump scare, I was just like, I don't enjoy it at all. Mm. um you know um but but yeah, yeah no uh, yeah like <laughs> i was i was just gonna say that um anticipatory anxiety is something that really gets to me and that's um that's the word <laughs> that's kind of what it seems like you experience with jump scares and even though i don't have that towards jump scares as much i definitely feel like we're kind of in the same zone there yeah, I think that might actually part of the be part of the reason why FNAF, like, I still don't enjoy FNAF, is because I, I haven't been exposed to many FNAF jump scares. Mm-hmm. So, like, uh, but all I know is that the few times that I have seen them, they've scared me. Mm-hmm. And they're so quick, and they're just flashes of, like, Aah! and, like, that's all I know. They're so vague to me, and I haven't, like, you know it's all anticipatory it's none of it is like me knowing what i'm actually scared of it's all anticipatory that's like oh there's this thing right Mm -hmm. um uh and i i um i hate to jump topic so much but uh i I (laughs) want to return to that topic on um uh visual novels a bit later yeah Uh, because i started talking about um i wanted to talk about horror movies i wanted to get back to that um so so the whole thing about horror movies for me is that because now that we've laid the groundwork for how mm-hmm. you guys can get a feel for how scared we get at stuff, <laughs> yes, guys, a baby. Um, <laughs> I don't like horror movies. I don't like the jump scares, and I don't like the killers. My problem with horror movies is this, and I want to see if you guys can relate to this. In horror movies, I um, they're too vague for me. They're very abstract for me. It feels like you're having to run away from this, like, thing. Like, there's this, in, like, this thing chasing me, trying to kill me. There's mm-hmm. this intentional vagueness in the writing of a horror movie and, and the killer because, you know, it's trying to tap into the fear of the unknown. But as a viewer, I'm left bored because I don't have enough details. Does that make okay. sense? Um... The, the, the best example I can think of is this uh, 2014 horror movie called It Follows. Have you heard of it? No. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's um, 
I don't even know who made it. But It Follows is this movie, it's this horror movie about, like, uh, she's be like, this woman thinks she's being chased by this unknown thread, and then her dead body's seen on the beach. So then, uh, meanwhile, two other people have sex, and then the next day, <laughs> what, the guy, uh, straps the girl to a wheelchair and says, hey, because I had sex with you, I actually transmitted the curse. Like, I was the target of the thing, and now you're the target of the thing. And now uh- it's gonna come after you. And she's like, what thing? The thing! And, um, <laughs> literally, like, I I was so bored because <laughs> I have nothing to latch on to, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's nothing that makes me feel like any involvement. It's just this thing! And I'm like, awesome, why do I care? <laughs> it's... And um and that's not to say that like oh any horror movie with this like vague killer is bad because no not at all Freddy Krueger and Pennywise I think they're very different because they have such memorable identities as characters and and I was talking with a friend the other day as a writer you need to value character in horror you need to give us a reason to care you need to give us some identity to latch onto you know definitely be be that in the killer or in the protagonists yeah instead of them just being like. Uh, bags of flesh that'll just be sliced up one by one like Mm -hmm. it's it's so much more interesting if you have this like interweaving like tail between the killer and the and the protagonist and whatnot you know freddy krueger and pennywise i think like they kind of do that for me um so even if i don't actually enjoy watching it because it has jump scares um (laughs) i will very much appreciate the um the the, the, the writing, just the writing. The story. Yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah but i, I again anticipatory like oh i don't like watching it because i want to get scared mm. um but yeah that's <laughs> all um uh was there anything you wanted to bring up about horror movie have you ever like watched a horror movie and like just did not enjoy it at all like has your family ever forced you to watch one <laughs> um yeah i mean Usually my family doesn't make me watch that kind of stuff. If if anybody makes me, it'll be my friends. Um, there was oh, right. like one time we went to the theater and I had to watch a scary one and it wasn't like the worst it could have been, but it was still like, uh, why am I here? Um, mm. There's another time where we watched uh, this movie, I think it's on Netflix, about like them playing the game would you rather but like to extremes um like they were put in this situation where they would have to choose and um people got like killed off while playing this game um so that (laughs) that that one really like stuck in my mind for some reason because uh it's one of those even though it wasn't like a like a traditional horror movie i just remember thinking uh, about like oh this story this whole premise and like thinking about the choices the characters had to make and stuff like that um but <laughs> mm. but that that's... I, I looked it up i see the movie's literally just called would you rather <laughs> Oh, okay, well, that, yeah, that's fair. That makes sense. <laughs> and the caption says, keep telling yourself it's just a game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first picture that appears is what looks like a very, a close-up of someone's eyeball with, like, a, oh, my God, ew, ew, ew. Oh? Uh, well, I hate stuff with eyes in general, but, like, what are the, the, the things that people used to slit their wrists? I'm so stupid. What are they called? Um, like, knives? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> nah, the small scissors. rectangular knives without like hand- scissors. Who does it with scissors? <laughs> I don't know. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like like uh the rec the the rectangular the small rectangle the files files that's what they're called right shaving files files, files? oh razors. Razor. Well, isn't a razor okay? Razor without the handle, right? Like just like the yeah. rectangular. Okay, <laughs> I'm so dumb. Uh, yeah. So it's just a picture of someone a razor next to someone's eyeball. Oh, like uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it there was there's some like gory stuff. I think. Oh, that was, gross. Like, yes. Bleh. 
Yeah, same with Saw. Saw, like, apparently started out, and I haven't watched Saw. You guys actually feel free to, like, correct me in the comments. I believe that Saw started out as a series of movies that were, like, much more atmospheric horror. And now it's what people call gore porn, I think. Mm. So it's just a bunch of, like, like overly graphic stuff because people enjoy that. And I'm like, how? <laughs> <laughs> It's a taste. That's the whole thing with horror as a whole. It's 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 a taste. Yeah, my uh, my brother and his boyfriend were watching American Horror Story for the longest time, and like every every so often, I'd just like glance over, and it would be like really gory, and I'd be like, uh, just "No, thank look, you." Uh, <laughs> just look back to my freaking baby baby stuff again. Yeah, I can't I can't do some certain stuff like that. It just makes me like ah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now I get that. Um, <laughs> just, just so, so discomforting. I don't know. Uh, but what I was talking about with uh, my whole thing with horror movies about seeking character. Um, I, I think some of the best examples that I've ever seen of that has been in visual novel games, which are you mm-hmm. know inherently character. Like they're very focused on characters. A lot of them are based in Japan, and uh, a lot of that like you know anime writing style is very character centric. Not yeah. always, obviously, uh, but, like, definitely in a lot of mainstream visual novels. So, for instance, in the Ace Attorney games, which is the biggest visual novel series of all time, there are a lot of, like, serial killers that I can think of in the series, which, you know, for, uh, for like, they have the same sort of template as, like, a, uh, a, a horror movie killer slasher guy, Um but you know that they were given, they're given such impact because you know how they negatively bring down and, like, have, like, made their mark on the intricate web of characters in this murder mystery story, right. you know? Yeah. And that's what's so lovely about murder mystery stories. It's like every event has some impact on the whole web of characters. And your job as a detective or an ace attorney, Phoenix, is mm-hmm. to untangle that web of people and why they did what they did because of all the people related to them so like you know a a serial killer put into that web is just so interesting because it's like oh my god they really tainted this web they like like there's one particular character i'm thinking of but like even conceptually you can understand like that's pretty cool yeah um but uh, the main thing I wanted to bring up, and I'm going to keep this brief because no one apparently has ever played it. Uh, <laughs> I've literally, oh my god, so Zero Escape. Everyone just watching groaned, but like, hear me out. Um, and for people who don't know why I'm making this out to be a big deal, I've literally gotten a total of nine people to get Zero Escape, and zero of them have actually played it. So I'm like, I- I'm the like the biggest Zero Escape fan ever, so I'm like, ugh. Um, mm. Here's the thing about Zero Escape, and, and also with Danganronpa, which everyone here has heard about. Haha. <laughs> um, uh-huh. The interesting thing about both of these games, Zero Escape and Danganronpa, is that they are two visual novel games which involve a cast of characters being locked in an enclosed space for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. Now, that has a lot of benefits when it comes to character development and getting to know characters more, because this enclosed space allows you to, allows like these innate little traits about the characters to really be brought out uh you can see people's dark sides a lot more often Mm -hmm. um and uh especially because like you know initially in this enclosed space engaging characters and the mystery of the enclosed space you're in will take your attention primarily but i will say unlike danganronpa zero escape uses this to to kind of like play with this like like especially the first game there, there comes moments where the claustrophobia of the space that you're in, like having seen the entirety of the ship and like, you know, like, oh God, there's no way out. or no, we only have nine hours to live and stuff like that. It gets to your head and stuff like that. You have mm. this dis- very descriptive slow burn of horror. The writing of Zero Escape, uh, the narration, is descriptive like a novel that you would read, like a book with pages. It is that <laughs> descriptive in text um 
And I, I heard someone once say that, like, oh, like, you know, books are, like, just the best form of media because, like, there are, you sometimes, like, there are things in books that you just cannot describe with movies and visuals. And I disagree wholeheartedly because um, <laughs> I think books are the most time-consuming form of media that I can possibly think of. <laughs> and uh, I don't. <laughs> uh, but I do love how descriptive that they have to be because they lack visuals yeah. so like usually with visual media like movies the director's job is to sort of like steer your attention towards something but when you have a game which not only does that but also has breaks when you just discover a dead body and then the game will tell you in excruciating detail like oh i saw this thing and it was like seeping like a blah 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 it allows room for connotation it allows room for just you know it allows room for it to just seep in and take it in at your own pace and not the characters um mm. You know, I really love that. I really, really do. Yeah. Um, and I guess while we're on the topic of... Um, uh, well, yeah, actually, before I say that, the other thing <laughs> I wanted to mention. Sorry. Um, no, you're good. The, the reason I'm a fan of this writing is because it's never about... The, the horror is never about the urgency. It's never about the direct danger, the direct threat. It is always the claustrophobic, ambiguous feeling that is always there, burning in in the background while you're trying to just figure out the mystery and the, like you have these character interactions in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, in especially the second game, there's some freakouts where like, oh my god, this character is actually like, oh my god, this character is dead. Oh my god, everyone's dead. Oh my god, how this happened. And like, there's all these like freakouts and stuff. By comparison, in Danganronpa, even though you're in this enclosed space. A character's death in that game is a whole ass like formulaic event to be chronicled mm -hmm. in a wiki, like f case three victim, you know. Yeah. Um, I I find like in Zero Escape and something else I wanted to bring up, Corpse Party. It's mm -hmm. like this genuinely scary shock when you turn the corner and see this character die because it's not formulaic. It's there's no obligation for this character to die. It's not a whole event and stuff like that. Like oh, you know it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. But, like, wow, it adds a lot. It's really cool. Yeah. Now, I'm not the resident Corpse Party fan. I've played one, chapter one and that's it. Uh, <laughs> but Corpse Party is another um, horror-esque visual novel, and a certain someone here is a very big fan of it. Yeah, so it's actually <laughs> what got me into anime, like, at, you know, in the beginning, I guess. Hey. Um, <laughs> yeah, so... My my big thing with Corpse Party is um, kind of going along with a point you said earlier. It's very... Um, it definitely gives enough attention to the characters. They're not just there to be hurt and just to be killed or anything. Like, I enjoyed Corpse Party so immensely because of the characters and because I got so invested in their fates and their relationships with each other. Um, so that was, like, my big thing with Corpse Party. Um, and also, like, even though it's... Um, there are some, like, CGs with gore in it. Like, it doesn't really bother me when it's animated as much. Um, mm -hmm. and, and some... St I mean, some events don't even have CGs, and in that case, they're just, like, you know, like, little pixels of, you know? <laughs> so oh, yeah, like, like, the little, like, 8-bit sprites. Like, yeah, like, to them. Yeah. oh, well, you know? <laughs> um, it happened. <laughs> yeah, but, but even though, like, atmospheric horror isn't always my thing, um, this had enough of it that I was, like, concerned for the characters, but it wasn't so much that I, like, did not enjoy myself while I was actually playing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the key is suspense, really. Yeah, Like, even yeah, if we don't definitely. care about atmospheric horror, suspense will get anyone. Um, yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, f- to even so, I don't know if anyone here has uh, played Corpse Party, but like the first death that happens in the game, I remember that when it happened, there was like this little glimpse of hope, like, oh my god, wait, we might be able to save this person. Let me leave mm-hmm. the place that they're dying in and see if I can like you know get something for them to live. And like, oh wait, no, they died. And like, there's this very there's this suspense with like you know, oh god, I don't know what's happening. And like, okay, but I might be able to do something when not able to do yes. something. And it's like very very cool. Maybe it's just different when. Like, because I I think I actually just criticized movies of doing this, and maybe it's different when you're playing because it feels like you actually do have impact just because it's interactive. Yeah, yeah, I can um, agree with that. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the unspoken, uh, or I guess the the thing that's taken for granted about interactive media. You're just mm-hmm. you kind of have to be engaged. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think, like, what you said about, um, you know, the fact that the character interactions, like, you know, obviously that's what you appreciate the series for right now, like, in 2020. You appreciate it mm-hmm. for the characters themselves and not, like, the, you know, the, the atmosphere of, you know, the horror and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's actually worth noting because a lot of people, for, for, for me at least... Horror in media usually comes at the expense of a character-driven story. Yeah. Um, definitely in movies. In movies when everyone is just, you know, like, uh, cast a protagonist and, you know, over the course of the movie, they're just going to be, like, picked off, like, fleet, like, just, like, just one after another. Just, mm-hmm. like, okay, like, you rarely give me the chance to get invested in this, this little, like, web of characters, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just kind of like they're off, they're off screen, and then they get slashed, and it's like, well, eh, it's no yeah. fun. And I would even say that goes for the Corpse Party anime as well, because the anime um <laughs> took this like big game with all these chapters and all these intricate details, and not that it's like the most complicated thing ever written, but it condensed them all to four like twenty minute episodes of anime, <laughs> and instead of like going with the ending that happened in the game they just like killed almost like everyone off so it was oh, like no. so definitely the anime had the feel of like okay we're just here to watch everybody die and like screw the story like oh, oh well I, I looked i looked up corpse party apparently it takes around 10 hours to beat the game so condensing it into like <laughs> 4 20 minute so wow that's that's yeah impressive. it was it was actually <laughs> painful <laughs> in a bad I, I, way. A, I mean, as a fan, I'm sure, but even me as not a fan, knowing that, you know, there was... Uh, knowing that Corpse Party's selling point, of course, is the atmosphere. It is a... a it is a uh, game that people come to know because it is a scary game about people trapped and they try to live. Like, that's all I know, really. Mm-hmm. And there's ghosts whatever I don't yeah know. <laughs> it, it's a little sad when that selling point is the only thing that becomes uh what's the word documented about that game in the long run you know yeah in ma- in like the mass media to the point where it gets an adaptation where the biggest selling point of it is that scare factor and not the value of the characters that actually kept your attention when it was interactive yeah Um, because there's oh man there are so many good relationships between these characters that just (laughs) have you like riveted and in in the anime it's like okay maybe they talked once maybe they talked a couple times and Mm. but i mean you don't get to care about any of them because it's so quick and it's that's uh, annoying. Yeah, it is it was very annoying. But um <laughs> yeah, my my other thing with with uh Corpse Party I should say is also I really enjoy the music. Mm. And I definitely am one of those people who like music is very pivotal to my enjoyment of something. Music so, is a core part of your identity as a person. Yeah, it really is. Um, so just especially for Corpse Party to have this like 
really great characters with these great interactions and relationships with each other and then for it to have like this awesome ass soundtrack as well i was like mm. i mean shoot why do you think i like zero escape <laughs> i yeah, bang yeah, out yeah. To that. i bang out to those songs <laughs> it's like this there's like this really scary song where like it, it's a tension song right like when something like yeah. oh my god something really bad just happened it's like dun 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 it's it's uh for the one person here who's played it chill and rigor um <laughs> Oh my god. Literally I bang out to that thing. <laughs> We're gonna have to have record. like a like a day where we just like listen to I'll listen to your chorus party tracks and then I'll show you my zero escape track. It's gonna say Yo! I'd be banging <laughs> out to the death song. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds amazing out of context. Oh yeah. I mean, that's Danganronpa as a whole. The whole thing has this, True. like, wonderful... I know I've been doing, like, subtle disses towards Danganronpa this whole time. But, like, <laughs> God, the music... I, I'm i weak to the music because, like, electro swing is my weakness. Mm. It's my favorite genre of music, and Danganronpa taps into that really well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like the whole... Because in Danganronpa, and I think this is a big part of the reason why you know, Zero Escape will choose to tap into the claustrophobic nature of everyone being trapped into a place, whereas Danganronpa doesn't, and it's like a big event. It's like, oh, it's the, uh, welcome to one, two, V3. We got like six chapters worth of, like, you know, it's the same stuff. It's basically, yeah. Anyways, I'm, I was about to spoil V3's ending. Uh, <laughs> V3's ending, you, now you know why I love the ending, because it's so, social commentary on like this whole formulaic nature of Z- Z- Danganronpa as a whole and the fans. Um... Anyways, basically, Danganronpa, death is fun, and investigation is cool, and shooting down uh, arguments is badass, right? Mm-hmm. It's tone. It's, it's just tone. That's really it. Yeah. That decision alone will steer everything about the creation of a game and the music and the writing and everything. That one mm-hmm. decision. In Zero Escape... Everyone's trapped as well, and there's this mystery to solve, and they want to get out. But um, I want them. I want there to be a lot of bad endings. I want you to have to f- find the truth in order to reach the true ending. I want there to be deaths, but and in like the uh, endings where you died, they need to really make an impact on you and really make you want to find the right way out by l- using what you learned from the bad endings. Mm-hmm. I want you to really feel, like, scared. Uh, I want you to feel claustrophobic. I want you to feel lost. Mm-hmm. So that when you're free, you feel free. You escape. <laughs> <laughs> um, that decision alone, man, it's, it's, it, it really steers, it really steers a lot. Um, and, and maybe, maybe I'm just, like, really burnt out of Danganronpa now, uh, even though I adore the series to death. Maybe I'm just a little burned out of it now, but like that's fair. that's why that's why I think uh, your turn to die that game you were bringing up, uh, bringing up earlier uh, mm. it actually kind of taps into what Zero Escape has going for it, and yeah, I really appreciate it. I really do. Yeah, um, I I definitely also love your turn to die. So <laughs> yeah, um, and I guess uh, <laughs> talking about your turn to die, like even though like it does have the infrequent jump scares that you know that bothers me. I actually see that in a lot of indie low budget games now that I think about it. Cause like you have mm-hmm. Doki Doki Literature Club, right? Like that game. Are you familiar with Doki Doki? Um, I, I know that it's like, uh, I, I've heard about it. <laughs> I know it's that basically, it goes there. Yeah. It, it's a visual, no- it's actually pretty cool. It's a visual novel game that markets itself as a very, basic normal cutesy visual mm. novel you're uh it's called doki doki literature club you're like you know you're in the literature club and you meet everyone and just trade poems with them and it's super cute and then a girl hangs herself yeah and then, <laughs> like it's this very uh it's this tonal dissonance between the music and visuals and everything about the game being happy and every once in a while something genuinely freaky happens with just no regard to everything else Mm -hmm. you know now um obviously again like (laughs) i hate the those jump scares man like they freak me out Mm -hmm. um but there is a lot to be said about tonal dissonance uh 
because in writing that is not always easy to pull off and hearing how doki doki literature club like genuinely was able to market itself as like this oh cutesy game and like but even though there's this really cute little warning at the start of the game going like hey you you should probably like you know uh, i forgot what the warning says but it says (laughs) like this game is for people who won't piss their pants lol doki doki literature club (laughs) (laughs) It's actually pretty fascinating to see that it actually grew into such a such a phenomenon just based on how polarizing the game actually is. Yeah. Like, like the writing of it, at least. Also, um, I think you nailed, like, you got it word for word what it says at the beginning, like the warning. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that is exactly what it says. No, I've never you played it. How'd <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Under, freaking Undertale has one jump scare in it, too, and I don't know why. Like, well, there, there's... Yeah. <laughs> really? Yes, in the at the very end of the bad ending, basically. There's a jump okay. scare. And it's dumb cuz it has no place in Undertale. <laughs> I don't, they were just I don't know. like, eh, let's throw this in here. See, yeah. see, make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> I'm paying attention, man. <laughs> I murdered every being in the world to get this bad ending. I paid attention. <laughs> um goodness. I guess, like, and and you know what? With that jump scare, it's the same thing with me as FNAF. I I have seen it once, scared me once. I'm vaguely familiar with it, but not enough to be comfortable to it. So I don't like it. And Mm. I think that actually kind of leads into the main point that I wanted to bring up in all of this. The thing about jump scares is it's or, or really being scared as a whole. It's not really about being repeatedly exposed to it that you know, that makes you feel comfortable with it. It's about you trusting it, knowing what to expect, obviously, but also knowing that nothing else will happen aside from that. Uh, And I'm explaining it really badly, but like, take for example, like the FNAF jump scares. If I were to actually really take in one of the jump scares, know what I'm to expect and to know what this game, build this trust between me and the game, that I know you're going to scare me this time, and I know that it is a punishment for losing, and Mm -hmm. I know what to expect from here on forward. That, I think, is the most productive way of, like, you know, building a resistance against a fear as a whole. And I think that sort of, that, that, lesson kind of actually came to me when i met kai last time and we went to king's Mm. island in ohio (laughs) see i don't like roller coasters (laughs) well it's less that i don't like them i just haven't really gone on them and the few times that i have (sighs) (laughs) um but i i went on all the roller coasters that like you know like i like you know i went on them with everyone else it was cool i went on them i i didn't really complain i just whined i didn't complain (laughs) is there a difference I mean, I feel like I get what you're saying. You get what I'm saying. I didn't say <laughs> I don't want to do this, but I said I can't believe I'm doing this. I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I, I, oh my freaking god! And... How did I do a 300 foot vertical drop? How did I do that? <laughs> and that would be the first one that we went on. <laughs> the what? Well, the first, which was a very smart idea because everyone afterwards, I'm like, there's no way I'll be able to do this. Wait, I literally, I statistically did one worse than this, <laughs> like at the very stars. <laughs> yeah, it's it was way worse. Like you got this, man. Yeah, honestly. How did I? Do? Okay, but seeing people raise their arms in the air, I was thinking I can't do that, and it's not because. It's not as simple as an answer as, I'm scared, I don't want to do it. But it's because I haven't built trust with the security of the roller coaster. I haven't built trust that if I raise my arms in the air, I won't go flying off. Mm. Um, the, the bars that go over your head, that go like over your shoulders and whatnot, right? Mm-hmm. I'm holding on to those because I don't have any, you know, I don't have any reason to believe besides all the people raising their arms for some stupid reason, I don't have any reason to believe that, you know, if I don't hold on to the bars the whole time, that I, you know, won't just fly off. (laughs) For all I know, I might. I haven't built that trust 
with the security of the roller coaster. And if I were to a handful of times, if I were to let go and just raise my arms in the air a handful of times, then I know that, yes, I can trust you. I know that you were built to be able to secure me even if I wasn't grabbing onto it for dear life while crying. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> that's kind of how I, like, came to visualize, like, pretty much dealing with all fears. Like, it's not just being exposed to it over and over again. It's not just, oh, raise your arms over and over again. And then eventually you learn it's okay. Like, I mean, yeah, you learn it's okay because you you learn to trust the thing. Mm. You know? Yeah, I definitely feel like um, the first few times that I, that I went on certain coasters, like, I didn't raise my arms or anything. But especially after, like, there was this one summer my family got gold passes to King's Island. And so we would go a lot. And I would always go with my friends. And I just got to, like, just go on these coasters that I loved over and over again. Well, I mean, now I, I don't really have a problem with, like, raising my arms in the air. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, back then it was like, ah! <laughs> like, I feel like I'll just... Whoop! Like, why yeah why why would right you have off. any reason to believe you wouldn't right yeah like, <laughs> if you're doing freaking loop-de-loops and corkscrews and going at five million miles per hour yes you'll fly <laughs> off of course you will it's <laughs> physics <laughs> you know and and that logic right there very much overrides the whole wait people don't usually fly off roller coasters <laughs> <laughs> but it's a kind of hard to process that and you know try when mm -hmm. you're like 10 seconds before falling 300 feet oh my god <laughs> you made it though i did i cried but i, made, I didn't cry i didn't cry i was a man i wasn't a man <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to make this sound better <laughs> you were cute basically i just said <sighs> yeah that, that's, that's pretty accurate <laughs> that's what i did yeah um but I was kind of thinking the same thing kind of goes for phobias. And I wanted to bring up how my cockroach phobia started, actually. Um, eighth grade me. Imagine imagine cute little eighth grade me. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm getting ready for school. I take off my jammies. I, <laughs> I'm shirtless in the mirror. And bef I am holding my shirt in my hands. And before I actually put the shirt on, I see these little antenna kind of waving at me in the mirror over my shoulder. Ugh. I'm like, What? It, that oh god man i haven't really seen many cockroaches before in real life that was one of my first encounters with them and it was just these two little antenna waving at me in the shoulder i remember yelling screaming running out of the bathroom yelling there was a cockroach on my back so you know trauma is you one traumatic experience will spark a phobia and ever since then that happened uh, unfortunately i live in texas and we move all the time which means we have cardboard boxes which cockroaches love um Oof. but i know that if i were not only exposed to cockroaches more but if i knew exactly what they were capable of that they can't literally hurt me that they won't like you know actually do anything to harm me i can build this trust between me and the cockroach do i have any intention of doing this no <laughs> no <laughs> but <laughs> at the very least i know that it is possible and i know that is how you do it you build that trust with the object uh i i saw this video yesterday about like someone who has claustrophobia going into this cave like uh, like like it's this little cave in the ground and they just kind of like fall into it and like kind of feel all the walls surrounding them and they, you can hear they're scared but they're in there for like 15 minutes and they're getting a feel for all the walls and they're getting a feel for the scope of their fear mm. and they got out and they were smiling it's kind yeah. of crazy huh <laughs> yeah i feel like that is definitely a fair way to look at it and it can definitely be true um for me i don't know if i relate to that just because like it <laughs> I feel like even if I quote unquote knew what to expect of what I was scared of, which for me is um bugs. So kind of goes along with the cockroach thing. But... So basically me times like twenty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I feel like even in that case, like it still like it still wouldn't 
I still wouldn't be able to do it. And Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is because, um, for me, I don't know of a specific moment when my fears started. To me, this is just how I've been since before I can remember, is I've always been scared of bugs. Always. Um, Yeah. And and like, (laughs) it's just, I was just gonna say, like, um, so it's, it, it also doesn't feel like a very, uh, logical thing to me. And I know that, like, you know, fear in general isn't logical, but to the extent of even bugs that other people are like, oh, it, like, do they even count as bugs? You know, like ladybugs or butterflies. I'm scared of those too. And it's not like a rational thing. It's not like I see a butterfly and I'm like, oh, I I know that those can't hurt me, so I'm going to be fine. No, I know they can't hurt me, but I'm still freaking out. <laughs> you know now, what I mean? Yeah. Now, um, as someone who uh, very much appreciates some insects, like butterflies, um, <laughs> like when I saw that you were scared of them, I was kind of like, huh? But um, <laughs> my... Uh, my my personal theory about yours is that <laughs> there isn't any particular, you know, sparking moment where this started. Because of that, I kind of feel like it's kind of a rule with yourself. As as much of a rule with yourself as if you jump, then gravity will pull you down. As much of a rule as, like, any rule in the universe, that you are scared of bugs. Because there isn't any defining starting point when you realized it. I know that sounds really silly. I know it sounds I mean, really I silly feel... to pull the card where it's like, oh, if you if you believe it's real, then it's real. But I think that's kind of what it is for you. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think you're like, yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, I, I think to an extent that's definitely true. And mm-hmm. um, I... I yeah, like like I was saying earlier, it's not a very like rational thing. It's just like it's almost like an involuntary response. Like when a bug comes yeah. near me, I'll like literally move in ways that I don't like just normally dance move. Away. No, like just give it up, like, and um, like there's this one time where uh I was at work and the manager told me that there was like a beetle or something on my pants. And I literally like did this, like, I, I, I don't even know what I did, but I like flailed to try to get it off and it was completely involuntary. And I don't even know what I did. I just like had this Mm. like freak out motion. And then it was like, ah, is it gone? I think that this whole thing is just ingrained into your code, and I think it is perfectly plausible that you can take the effort to, you know, eventually work to, you know, be more resistant to it. And I think in a lot of instances, like, you know, beetles and cockroaches and spiders and, like, you know, like, stuff like that, I think, like, you know... If I were had a phobia of beetles and spiders and cockroaches, I was like, oh no, I don't. I'm not even gonna bother. Yeah, no, I'm Friggin- not ever gonna bother yeah, with those. <laughs> screw that. But I kind of want to. No, it's a bad idea. Out, shut up. I kind no, it's of want a bad to idea. <laughs> figure out, figure out a way to over time, even if it takes like 50 years, over time mm. get you not as ha- have these involuntary reactions to like butterflies okay <laughs> that's but, uh... not to say i'm gonna <laughs> stick one in your face because i think that's stupid <laughs> <laughs> well i trust you so yeah <laughs> i'm a psych major i will figure but... <laughs> out a way <laughs> yeah that also because i think that up... can actually harm your life <laughs> yeah no i think it would also harm our relationship uh and <laughs> well i think it would harm like you going out again if you realize that yeah. <laughs> outside is home to bugs God forbid well, you ever I do learn have that. that. I do have that realization, like, all the time. Like, every time I go outside, I'm like, why? Yeah, and I'm like, that's, <laughs> hey, that's a hot take. That's kind of a little stupid. So I it want is, you to, like, go. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but that actually reminds me of, this also has to do with being scared, but, um, so there's one time where, um, when I was a lot younger, maybe, like, nine or something, um, mm-hmm. we 
my family was at the zoo and they wanted to go through the butterfly house and they, for some reason, uh, were not aware that butterflies were also a thing that, you know, went along with bugs for me. Um, I don't know how, but, uh, so basically they kind of made me go in, um, and there was, like, 0.2 seconds where, like, I got pushed through the door and I just, like, froze, and I Mm. just had this moment of, like, um, what's the word? Like, you know when like overloaded like my senses were like overloaded and uh-huh. like everywhere you looked there was one you know and uh-huh. i was frozen and then i took off sprinting through the thing probably uh i don't know how i didn't like crush anything because i literally sprinted She's uh in- to get through and out of the other side. I couldn't even do that. And they're, they're, you know, like, it's, like, (laughs) so, it's, uh, yeah. I I mean, okay, so, the question, if there was something that you didn't know was technically considered a bug, and you were fine with it because you didn't know it was technically considered a bug, and then I told you that it was a bug, would you be scared of it just because after I tell you that it is technically a bug? I mean, I don't think so, but also I can't think of anything. I can. <laughs> uh... I didn't know that the cockroach in Wally was a cockroach. <laughs> really? <laughs> It doesn't have any cockroach-like features at all. It does not have the <laughs> creepy legs. It has this neat curvature to it, and it has all the mannerisms of a dog. So <laughs> when I watch the movie, I don't even know what it is when I'm a kid. It's a being, you know? So, mm-hmm. like, it's scuttling around. It's doing cockroach things. It doesn't die like real-life cockroaches. They just don't die. <laughs> but it's so obedient. It's so nice. And you never see in graphic detail, like, the scuttling legs and, like, it's twitching. It's, like, things and it's, like, so gross and stuff. You don't see it in that level of excruciatingly disgusting insect-like detail. What you mm-hmm. see is this weird curving brown banana-looking thing with, like, like you know, and it, it makes, like, these cute little beep sounds. And, like, I don't even know what it is. But, and, and then, like, you know, years later, I get my cockroach phobia. Like, f- five, four years later? Wait, no. 2009, 2004. So it's, like, six years later. And then and I watch the movie again, frame. and I'm, like, kind of had this realization where I'm, like, oh, it's a cockroach. All right. Uh- <laughs> you know, but, like, you know, it's, it's not like I'm scared of it just because technically it is a cockroach. Like, no, it, it doesn't have the features of actual cockroaches that I'm scared of, you know? So that's what I was wondering for you. If you were to see something that, like, you know, you weren't initially scared of, and then someone told you that it is technically, by definition, a bug, would you then be scared of it just because of the definition? I don't know. (laughs) That's something that keeps me up at night. (laughs) But also, like, I feel like in animation, because things can be changed so much, that it's also kind of, you know, like... Eh, I mean, you didn't recognize it as a cockroach, but that's kind of fair. It wasn't really, like, drawn or depicted as you would see or experience one in real life, you know? Yeah. So, uh, did are you scared of the cockroach in Wally? No. Okay. So, there you go. <laughs> um, eh. I think it's the same. <laughs> I think so. I think it's connected. Um... <laughs> Uh, and, and you know what, I mean, I, I, we've, we've gone on this uh, talk for a while now, but I mean, it's, it's all just the greater kind of topic of just, I don't ever desire to go out of my way to seek discomfort. I think I can, Mm -hmm. you know, live perfectly fine as I am right now. The only thing that I'm scared (laughs) of are cockroaches and I am pretty good at like, 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 well, okay. The last cockroach I have to, eh, the bed, the bed, the last cockroach I had to deal with was not too big. It was not as big as i'm used to i was in call with kaya when i saw it yeah i was gonna say that was i was there for that yeah yeah she heard me freaking out but i wouldn't have like you know gone up and sprayed it if i you know if if it was yeah yeah, it was smaller it was smaller than usual and you know what that experience while you know i'm still scared of them 
I kind of, you know, got a better... I, 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 I got more experience with it, and I built more trust with what cockroaches are capable of. Mm. I, I think... I, 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 what I said earlier, I think is an even better way to describe it. I understand the scope of my fear, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's definitely a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, uh, we, we usually, uh, throw down a couple of bullet points before we start a Life of Screens episode, and I see that you wrote down two, uh, stories about you being scared that I am interested in, because I don't think I've heard either <laughs> of them. Oh no! Well, I've heard I've heard this one, but not this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, the first one is pretty silly. It's just like a little. Um, there was <laughs> there was one day where I was walking back from work, and it was dark. And for some reason, you know, I got all up in my head about um, just about okay, but what if tonight's the night? You know, like there's something. <laughs> <laughs> like there's something gonna gonna happen, you know. Like you're walking at night, and you're and then a guy walking. shanks you in the corner. Like a- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. No, but like um, I don't have to like go through like woods, but there's kind of this one part where I walk like behind uh this Walgreens, like through this. Oh god, not the Walgreens parking thing. lot. <laughs> no, not through the parking lot. I oh, know, I'm sorry, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Like I walk uh in the like grass area like that goes behind it. Uh. Um and like you end up near the trees and like there's this yeah, I don't know. Like that day, I was just getting like really freaked out and like in my own head, like uh, this is creepy. And <laughs> you're too distracted like, by that. To uh, notice. <laughs> yeah. So like all of all of that was going on, and then I finally like get home, and um, I think I was going to unlock the door, and I saw something out of the corner of my eye, and I kind of like freaked out a little bit like i i did this the little like involuntary gasp thing like i was like Uh. (laughs) and turned (laughs) and like turned around really quick um but what it was was uh the thing i saw out of the corner of my eye it was the umbrella that i had open (laughs) that was behind me (laughs) 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 and god forbid (laughs) And it was just really funny because I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Although I will say, you know, I will validate your fear. I don't, why am I doing this? This might scar you. I'm going to do it anyways. I saw oh, this no. one gif of an umbrella that like took off its skin. So it's just the eight <laughs> strands and then it crawled away like a giant metallic spider and it was terrifying. Oh, gross. Okay. Yeah. I never want to see that ever again. <laughs> uh, yeah, <God>. no. <laughs> Um, no, that's fair. I mean, I've been, you, you know the stupidest thing I can think of that I've been scared by? hmm It's on stream, I guess. I was, I was in the middle of uh, playing Earthbound, and, like, this one thing happened where, like, my controls got reversed in-game, and then it confused me, and I was really tired, and I was dehydrated, and I got so confused that I started talking over my own words and stumbling, and I needed to take a break, so I turned off the game for a bit and just talked to chat, got some mm-hmm. water. I was kind of recuperating. All of a sudden, the stream notification played. It's like, bring I was like, oh my god! <laughs> and the guy it just said, like, thanks for subscribing. And then you just have my face right above the thanks for subscribing notification. I'm like, ah! <laughs> it was That's pretty good. Funny. It was pretty good. It was also very stupid. <laughs> That, that's a good moment, though. I'm glad that that's uh, documented. It is documented, unfortunately. <laughs> Golly. Goodness. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the lesson to be learned from everything that we've talked about is you have to build faith with the thing that you're scared of and, you know, understand the scope of it. If you're not interested in facing it and making it better, like us, then at least <laughs> I think this is a good way to characterize, like, even just jump scares in video games and movies as a whole, because I will say just like how I wouldn't be scared of roller coasters if I had a mental idea of how strong the security is, I wouldn't be scared of jump scares if I knew, like, you know, just what I was getting into. But, I mean, then one could argue that that kills the scare if you, like, really have to make yourself comfortable to it, like, you know, FNAF, like, that. then then you're not really playing it for the scares anymore. You're playing it just to win the game. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that's that's another point to be brought up. 
It's a conundrum. It is a conundrum, isn't it? So it's yeah. so it's kind of a catch twenty two. You just have to once you once you become comfortable with it, it just loses its value. That is so. That is a conundrum. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Um. <laughs> But yeah, no, uh, that's 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 the general gist. And while I still don't really care for horror, which I mean, it's unfortunate because my viewers constantly tell me to um, <laughs> play horror games on stream. Constantly, mm-hmm. I think Amnesia is the biggest one, and I'm like, no. Oh my god, is that the one that like freaking like PewDiePie uh-huh. used to oh, play yes. all the time? Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. I don't. I don't know anything about it. I'm. I'm. I'm good, bro. I'm going to keep playing my Kirby's and <laughs> Bogemons and anime. <laughs> Would you play a scary game with me? Um. <laughs> See, the thing is, I just don't find <laughs> scary games fun. Yeah. So I'm like, I, I want to have fun with you. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. <laughs> 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 like uh, okay cuz here's here's the bottom line. Why do we like watch media, right? Mm-hmm. Do, do you do it for story? Do you do it for character? Do you do it for action or thrill? Maybe the reason why horror is so situational. Why is it why is a flavor? Is because it is for people who seek thrill when they're watching yeah. or playing something. They're not into it to see the character webs and and to see their interactions and grow together and stuff like that. No, they're into it to see characters and to, like to get thrilled. They're in it for themselves, you know? The viewers mm-hmm. into it so that the viewer themselves can get that thrill. Um Yeah, that definitely yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, for a lot of like one-off action movies, that becomes very clear. <laughs> to me, obviously, that thrill usually comes at the expense of character-driven story, which is what I watch media for, mm-hmm. uh, if you couldn't tell from this last hour. Um, <laughs> but as a writer of my own passion project, it becomes obvious when I write scenes where, you know, in every in every section, I try to have some form of character development in literally every single section of it. It becomes obvious that not everyone who watches is a critic of character development. A lot of casual viewers want to watch something, you know, thrilling and bookmark a memorable highlight before moving on. Yeah. Um, like, this this is tangently related. I was I actually wanted to test this theory. I, I asked my mom, like, what's the... When you think of Ratatouille, what do you think of? And she's like, that one scene where Anton Ego eats the food and then he's, like, pulled back into his childhood and, like, oh, it's just, like, mama's food. Mm. Uh do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, that's the thing that everyone remembers from that movie, right? And, like, I asked, like, with Wally, what do you remember from Wally? And she's like, oh, yeah, like, the desolate planet and him, like, making, like, trash and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, um, maybe the first one wasn't a good example. But, like, I, I, I asked her about a bunch of movies and it's like, what's the visual? What's the one scene, one visual that you remember? And this experience kind of taught me, like, hey, no every single scene that you make doesn't need to ever they don't all need to serve the purpose of this overarching character development between all the characters and building their web together no it is also worth just creating scenes that you know primarily just have a lasting impact something ballsy you know like straight up going into the villain's like past for like five seconds like Anton Ego's past for five seconds just to really place emphasis on how much it meant to him little ballsy Mm -hmm. moments like that that kind of taught me the value of you know prioritizing thrill over character development so Mm -hmm. I started to insert a little bit more of that into my writing and uh yeah that's kind of tangently related to the whole horror um discussion but I wanted to share that (laughs) yeah it's it's kind of like if you can use it in moderation Mm-hmm. then I feel like it can add a little something, something. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Because even, like, with uh, a lot of sitcoms, which go on for hours and hours, like, uh, mm. or, or rather, like, you know, the, the entire runtime of the entire show is, like, you know, very long. Um, yeah. The thing that I'll always remember the most is just, you know, those really weird, stupid moments. Not, like, you know, the eight seasons worth of all the characters, like... Well, sorry, sorry, let me rephrase. I do remember all of the eight seasons of characters like coming and going and like like growing closer and breaking apart because of drama and stuff like that. 
But mm-hmm. also, that is not the majority of the audience. And that is something really important to remember as a writer. The majority of the audience is going to say, like, oh, you remember that one thing? That mm-hmm. one time that that really cool thing happened? That was That is, like, the main thing that I grabbed from that. And that is what stays in the public consciousness. A lot more than an essay, an essay's worth of talking about, like, oh, this character development writing over the course of so much time, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think I think it's good for your story to have like natural, um, you know, natural uh, rising and falling action, even aside from just the actual climax, you know, uh-huh. of the whole story. Like I think having those little peak moments and little dips back into like the regular. Um, mm-hmm. is is what helps keep people engaged and keep people like okay you know this there's okay. some substance there's some yeah because yeah, this is I, this is what i enjoy yeah because i feel like even uh that little summary of what i told you from it follows for instance the the mm-hmm. little summary that i just gave you it's very flat it's like okay killer person dies okay people have sex okay it's because i transmitted the killer to you and it's like you know like <laughs> I watched the first half hour and it was like this very, it was very flat. It doesn't matter if the entire thing was high tension about like, you know, it's like, oh, people dying. Oh, you might die next. And the entire thing's at that high tension. It's still a flat line. And, yeah. you know, if you don't do something ballsy, like all of a sudden, like, oh, bring me into the killer's childhood or something, or like really real, some really crazy truth about the survivors that will actually impact the story from here on out. Uh, Cause mm-hmm. you know, the, purpose of a plot twist is to twist the plot (laughs) twist it (laughs) Uh um like you know that would get me so invested in horror movies it really would probably Mm -hmm. not enough so i would watch them because i don't want to get scared (laughs) but i would become very interested in the writing of them i will say that i will definitely give them yeah Yeah, I um I do want to say since you brought that movie up again, uh, mm-hmm. even even I know that uh, if you're in a horror movie, you're not supposed to have sex because you <laughs> <will die. laughs> I mean, fair. There's this one Geico <laughs> commercial about like uh like it's like these four people like quote unquote in a horror movie and they're like running away from the killer and she's like oh let's hide behind the chainsaws yeah and they like what? hide behind the cha- and the and the killer's right behind the chainsaws and the narrator's like if you're in a horror movie you make bad decisions it's what you do <laughs> yeah that's basically it <laughs> and and then like as he's talking about Geico insurance like you know it's what you do you can hear very faintly in the background let's hide in the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good <laughs> let's hide in this abandoned weapon factory <laughs> let's hide in the walgreens parking lot <laughs> shut up <laughs> <I'm> sorry <laughs> i mean that brings up this whole separate conversation about like why are they so ridiculous why why are the premises and the events that happen so ridiculous just for the purposes of having easy kills you know like does Sharknado just... count as a horror movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's a it's it's a horror to the entirety of the movie industry. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Yeah, Sharknado. We're throwing count. shade. <laughs> it's a disaster. Literally, it's a disaster <laughs> film. Oh my goodness. Oh no. Now, um, if there's nothing else to be said, uh, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to dress <laughs> up at, in my true Halloween outfit. The Beetlejuice thing was just, you know, that was that was a distraction. I'm going to dress up as a can of beans. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Bushes baked. <laughs> I, I'm definitely going to get a giant cylinder, carve bushes baked into it, and walk around <laughs> asking people if they want beans. And they're going to say yes, and then I just kind of like... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that'll definitely... That'll definitely... Uh, that won't scar Make you a lot all. of friends. <laughs> that won't scar kids at all, man. Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, before we end off, I think I actually have a really short story about... Oh, no. <laughs> really depressed kid on Halloween. Um, oh no! Uh, maybe not depressed. More just like he didn't want to be there. Um, okay. And if you can think of any Halloween stories, you can share. But like basically, <laughs> oh my god, this kid! I um I was just at home. I you know for the past few years, like ten years, I haven't been doing trick or treating, but I do give out candy whenever kids come over. And I used to live in a neighborhood with a lot of kids. So I um 
I would give candy to all of them. They'd be like, trick or treat. And I'm like, oh my God, what are you? What are you? That's so cool. And like, we talked and stuff like that. I gave them crappy candy and they left. Now, um, mm-hmm. th- like there was one point where like, you know, it's been 20 minutes since the last group of kids. I'm like, okay, they're probably done. Like trick or treating is probably over. Um, like 20, 30 minutes pass, 40 minutes pass. And then the doorbell rings. I'm like, is that a trick or treater? Mm-hmm. I open the doorbell. It's this one like really meek kid. Like, this little short, like, kid, man. Like, he's so innocent and pure, I guess. But he's also just so done with life. <laughs> and I could see his mom standing, like, on the sidewalk, like, like across from, like, you know, the walkway to my house. Like, she was, like, across. Yeah. And he doesn't even, he's, like, I don't even think he said trick or treat. I opened the door <laughs> And, like, I don't even remember what we said. Like, hey, and then I give him the candy. He immediately turns tail and dashes. <laughs> runs down the freaking, like, road to my house back to uh, the mom. And then, like, like before that, uh, I go, like, hey, wait, what are you supposed to be? And he turns around and he goes, like, and he, he says over his shoulder. He half turns around and look to, looks at me over his shoulder and says, Optimus Prime. And then just walks away. <laughs> And it was, like, the funniest way ever. Just, Optimus Pro. <laughs> and then he went back That's to his really mom. That's really cute. It was pretty cute, and I also felt really bad for him. <laughs> <laughs> I will Poor never kid. be able to get out of my head, Optimus Pro. <laughs> he was ready to go home. <laughs> that will stick with me forever. Yeah, he really was. It was an eternal mood. <laughs> <laughs> so next, uh-huh. so this Halloween, I'm going... Bushes bang. Oh no. <laughs> yes, you will be sure to make many friends. <laughs> oh yeah. Really. Um, last Halloween when we got trick or treaters at our house, there were a couple good moments. One of them was um this person please don't ask me what it was because I don't remember, but it was like something from Minecraft that they were dressed up as. Mm. Um and and they like outright told me they were like, Hey, I'm this from Minecraft and I was like, Oh, that's really cool. Like look at you, you got all that going on. Um <laughs> and there <laughs> there was there were other times where, um, cause I was mainly opening the door to see if any of them would react to Rally in his little bat dog outfit. And, <laughs> the real star um, of the show, y'all. Come on. <laughs> basically. And this one time, <laughs> there was this group of kids came up and there, to, to, I remember these two girls in particular, like one of them was like, hey, it's crypto or something. <laughs> that was like, close. <laughs> but what's crypto? <laughs> crypto is Superman's dog. <laughs> Oh, I never even knew that. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, I don't watch cartoons. Probably she do. said something like that, and I was like, hmm, close. <laughs> it, was, it was really they, they had the right, they were in the ballpark, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they get and half he, credit. He was, he was definitely cute. But yeah, that, that uh, little kids can be funny. Uh, they... try, try answering the door if... Uh, if COVID doesn't make everybody stay home because they they can do and say some interesting things. <laughs> I know you did not mean it like this at all, but like oh, it's no. just the way you said, like little kids can be funny. I'm like, yeah, that's not <laughs> condescending at all. <laughs> I know it's not. I know you didn't mean it like that, but like <laughs> Optimus Prime leaves. <laughs> just... Kids, man, they, they bring out yeah. the best in life. They bring out the best of humanity and the worst. And that one, um, that same Halloween, there was this one kid who, like, said trick-or-treat, and then I was like, here you go, and I gave him a candy, and then he, like, gave me a hug and then left, like, completely unprompted, and I was like, okay. (laughs) Bro, I want to hug someone. Yeah. Literally, they're going (laughs) to imagine, ding dong, open the door, trick-or-treat, I just hug them just right off the bat, like, give me one. (laughs) <laughs> Give me a big warm embrace. <laughs> I think it's okay if the kid does it, but I think if the the other person <laughs> did it, it would be a little. Hmm. I'm just like a, like a middle aged man. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, that would not that... be good. <laughs> hey man, it's Halloween. Gotta give gotta give some parents some spoons. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! 
if you want to get arrested, sure. <laughs>